anyone who's been in level four with me for more than a couple of weeks knows that I make a big deal of the difference between two questions when you're looking at the text of scripture. What did it mean and what does it mean? And I spend a great deal of energy in the classroom and in my research and life in separating those two questions and focusing on what did it mean back in the first century. But I do that in order that you might bring them back together having considered them separately. We need to do them together. It's hard work to separate them and it's even harder work to understand the ancient situation. It's cross-cultural thinking. You have to forget about your own point of view, your own ideas, and listen carefully to the other. It's hard work, but the goal is always to bring them back together again. Usually bringing them back together again means, how does that ancient story speak to us in our way of thinking today? How does the ancient come to today? But there is another way of playing the game. And you saw Chloe do it if you were at her session in prayer week. You saw Lydia do it last week in her enacting of the Bible story. There is another way, the way of imagination, alongside the cross-cultural, the understanding the ancient. It's possible to ask not, how does the ancient story speak to us today? But rather to ask, how would our ways of thinking look and feel if they came up in the ancient story? Not to bring the ancient story to our lives, but to bring our lives back into the context of the ancient story and see how they fare. That's the kind of sermon this is going to be. It's a little weird, bear with me. It's pilot, but a curiously 21st century pilot encountering Jesus in John's gospel. Let's pray to begin. Father God, we pray that you would take our research, my research, and our imagination, my imagination, and help us to enjoy them, but help them to pass away and leave behind your message. I pray that you would help people to forget about me and my thinking, but to see something of you that stays with them through what I do. Thank you, Lord. In your son's name, amen. The Roman Empire, majesty, might, the Caesars, the senators, Roman law, Roman roads, Roman conquests, an empire, a nation, eternal, never ending, the supreme military force in the civilized world. All important trade routes pass through Rome. All roads lead to Rome and always will. And I, I am Rome. In this place I am anyway, this place. Of all the petty conquered kingdoms to be prefect of, they send me to Judea. But it's just for a time. I shall deal with these troublesome natives in such a way that my success here will be a legend. And the name Pontius Pilate will resound all over Rome. And then I can go back, back to the real world and further my political career. For I, like Rome, must be ambitious, must be powerful, must be wise, and must, above all things, keep things in perspective. It's so important to keep things in their proper perspective. Don't you agree? Now, it's almost funny, because we mortals can see so little of the universe at a glance we so often exaggerate the importance of little incidents, little people. 
as if something that happens to us one spring day could be of greater importance than the whole of the empire. No, one must keep one's head, remembering above all who you are, realizing your place in the system, in the scheme of things. For if you give your identity up, who could give you another? I'll tell you the key. Keep a firm hold on yourself and turn your circumstances into opportunities. That's the trick. This last case of mine happens to be a particularly good example of a close call. I could have lost everything so easily, but thank the gods I was able to get my priorities straightened out before it was too late. In the end, one of the native peasants had to lose his miserable life, but no real harm was done to my career. Allow me to tell you the story. You know, I made two nearly fatal slip-ups. Twice during this affair, I nearly lost that important sense of perspective. But fortunately, I was able to recover and masterfully turn the situation around to my ultimate advantage. It started with one of those routine matters of state. The natives routinely bring criminals to me to ratify their sentences. Sometimes I wonder if we Romans aren't a bit too tolerant of the customs of others. They're allowed to have their own laws as long as they don't force them on anyone else. They're even allowed to administer their own punishments up to a point. Rome alone though, through my prefecture, may administer the harsher penalties. The head natives seemed agitated this particular morning. They all seemed routine to me, yet they were evasive about the crimes of one particular convict, evasive about his crimes, but very certain about the penalty they wanted, death. And so I interviewed this criminal, this peasant native. I confess to you now that I was astonished. He was clearly one of them. The color of his skin, the look on his face, he, he was a native, one of those from the north as well, from Galilee, yet something about his face, something about his bearing. I, I, I could have sworn that I was looking at a, at a, at a Caesar. You, you'll laugh at my foolishness, but at this point, the, the whole room was swimming as if I'd had too much wine. I felt dizzy, my vision went strange, and for a time I saw nothing clearly. You know, it, it felt almost as if, it was almost as if everything in the room was crooked or askew, except for this one peasant. I, I was aware that I was faltering. I knew I had to say something, address some questions to the fellow, turn it into a proper interrogation. So the chief priest had mentioned something about his claims. So I found myself asking, so are you the king here then? And he said, what do you think? But I was starting to revive now. Do I look like a Jew to you? Was my smart comeback. I felt better. I, I'd stopped looking directly at him, see. I, I found when I looked at him, everything was shifting below me, but I looked away and I, I hid it and I smirked. You must have royally messed up somewhere, eh? My kingdom, he said, simply is not of this world. Whoa, I thought. Maybe he really does think of himself as a king, but not of this world? He, he said more, but I wasn't listening too closely. The important thing was that he didn't conceive of his interests as interfering in Caesar's interests. This peasant wasn't really a threat at all. Some religious nut maybe, but not a political one, like some of those native rabble rousers. And, while I was musing over this, I, I have heard him say something about truth. <laughs> How easily he used that word, sounding as if he understood what it meant. <laughs> I meant to ask sarcastically, oh, and what is truth? But I made the mistake of looking at him and everything was shifting at, underneath me when I did that and it came out more as if I was like really asking him, what is truth? As if he could tell me, it was unnerving the way that he didn't answer. He just stood there in front of me. 
as if the answer to my question should have been obvious to me, as if him being there was itself some sort of answer. The dizzy shaking feeling wouldn't go away, so I just left. And somehow, although I didn't really like the peasant, I couldn't help feeling as if I'd have liked to set him free. He seemed innocent, more importantly, seemed harmless enough politically, no real danger to my future. I began hatching a plan. Perhaps I could find a way to set him free and show me in a good light. It, it seemed a clever idea at the time, the generous Roman governor keeping control by allowing the natives to have their politically impotent leaders back. At the occasion of their holidays, it was custom for me to free one prisoner. Why not this so-called king of theirs? I mean, how generous could a Roman ruler get? This was the first of the slip-ups I spoke of earlier. I offered them the freedom of this king. They chose instead Barabbas, notorious terrorist bandit. But this trying to act on Jesus' innocence got me into potential trouble after all. I could just see the report to Rome. Pilate frees nationalist murderer. This was the first of the slips. I was mixing business with morals. Allowing what I believed, what I felt, to affect my day-to-day -day existence. This I know now is always a mistake. You know, you have to let go of the sky and set your mind on the things below. Whatsoever is practical, whatsoever is expedient, think on these things. Away from him, I was feeling more like myself. And it struck me, it'd be a good idea to have him whipped. I was angry with him for the occasion of this slip up. And I must admit, having him suffer for it sounded like a good idea. But it was more than that, see? The orders make good political sense as well. A good beating would help the morale of the troops, who've always been itching to let these silly peasants have what they deserve. Furthermore, it seemed to be what the natives desired as well. And it might improve my standing with them without my having to do anything inconvenient. Still, I suppose I hoped that the peasant would be let off the hook after the beating. That was not to be, however, because even after a, such a public and complete humiliation, the natives still weren't satisfied, calling all the more loudly for his death. I'd lost my temper with him and was still over the edge when receiving the demands of the crowd and foolishly got into a shouting match with them. You crucify him, I shouted. I see no reason to condemn him. But their return shouts contained something that stunned me. He claimed to be son of God, they complained. Well, that hit me like a Doric column in the face. Son of God? I'd heard about great heroes and sons of gods visiting Earth. For a few minutes, I began to worry. What if there was something supernatural about this man? Suppose he was from the gods and not from Earth. Momentarily, I forgot myself again. I rushed back to him and asked the question, where are you from? It was a terrible moment. I felt myself right on the brink. Anything could have happened. But incredibly, once again, the peasants stood there silent. So close was I to ruin that I could almost have believed it all without him saying anything more, but no, but no. I mean, silence? What kind of a son of God would fail to use rhetorical proof or powerful demonstration? No God that I could follow. What kind of God is it that would expect you to like drop everything and follow him merely on goodwill, take it all on faith? Why, the followers would all be ignorant, innocent little boys and girls, not educated, powerful, influential people. They'd be followers, not leaders. <laughs> Yet, as I said, I was so close to ruin, I could almost have fallen for it. Perhaps I would have, but then he made his big mistake. Yeah, up until the second interview, I'd only been thinking of him. I think that's what made it so dangerous. But in the silence, I could see a look in his eye. It was a look in his eye like, like 
he was willing to forgive me. Pfft. Well, to forgive is one thing, but the implication of forgiving is that he was judging, as if he, a native, had the right to have an opinion about me. Him, judge me. And yeah, being brought back to consider myself roused me from my dazed state, fortunately. It feels good to be brought back to yourself. Now, here's a weird thing. When I focused on him, it felt like, it felt like I was, I don't know, it felt like I was leaving a boat. It felt as if I were like standing on water. And looking at him was like being balanced precariously on the waves and the wind. But the good thing was, when I took my attention off of him, that was much less dangerous. I could feel myself sinking comfortably back to my normal way of thinking. And my feet touched bottom again, solid earth. And I felt surrounded by the familiar. What a relief to be my own master again. And so now I looked at him, still silently standing there, and I said to him, I said, and I, and I think you might have said the same thing if you ever got the chance. I said to him, listen, Jesus, don't you know who I am? Don't you have any idea who you're talking to? Your fate is in my hands. I have the power to get you back in touch with your followers. One word from me, and you're either out of here alive and well, or you're out of here to rot in the ground. That was the truth. And that was the core of the matter. And you know, I think he knew it as well. The look in his eye changed at that moment from that arrogant offer of forgiveness I mentioned to something more like disappointment. As he sensed the earth shaking importance of me and my decision. Now I knew I was back in control. The things that I said were able to affect him. That's more like it. Yep, that was the second slip I spoke of at the beginning and the most dangerous. I, I almost lost my sense of identity. That crucial knowledge of my own status and my own self-worth. Everything was disjointed, out of perspective for a few seconds, as if this Jesus was the center of space and time as if somehow I owed him something. Fortunately, I saw through it just in time. I was still phased enough to try and free him for a while, but the better plan was slowly evolving in my mind. When it was almost their Passover festival, festival it all clicked together per beautifully. The king business was the part to play up, not this tricky son of God stuff. If I treated the peasant as if he were their king, the figurehead of their tribe. Perhaps I could get them to see that their tribe was finished. They were Roman subjects now. They wanted this Jesus dead very well, but they have to bury their nationalism with him. Clever, huh? I had to tease them a bit, dangling him in front of their idiot noses. What shall I do with your king? What shall become of the head native? It took a while, but finally to my delight, they exceeded my expectations. And they yelled to me, we have no king but Caesar. Trapped by their own hatred, what a report this will make for the emperor. Sir, apprehended and crucified a so-called king of the Jews, followers scattered, the Jews in power persuaded to see their error and have cheered publicly, we have no king but Caesar. Perfect. Poor Carpenter had to go, but what's one man? compared to the smooth running of the eternal empire. Actually, you know, sometimes I wonder if I haven't done him a service. I mean, someday when I return triumphant to Rome and my biography is written and published, this Jesus incident might be described in some early chapter or other. And so it might be that thanks to my fame, his fame will spread as well to places he and his fishermen followers could never dream of taking it. So you see, keeping things in perspective, that's the key. 
knowing your own status within the larger system and keeping everything in its place. Institutions are more than individuals. You and me and this Jesus, we're all going to die and disappear forever. Rome will go on. Don't let someone else get in your head, much less your heart. Now, there's no denying he was a good man, a remarkable teacher. He had something about him. Maybe we'd even attend a service to honor him after he's gone, if it's at a convenient time. But I wouldn't want to get carried away by it all. These, these people, they, they, just, they just don't know how the world works. You know, they have this story about a garden called Eden. Before things went what they call wrong and you and I call normal, Back then, they claim, people walked with their God in the cool of the day. <laughs> Whatever. Even if it were true, people, you can't turn the sundial back to some ideal time. In this age and day and age, your God is not going to come back and walk around among you, full of grace and truth. Get a real life. Now, some of them are okay, but the rest, it's like they have their hearts and their eyes fixed on things that they can't even see. No, that's not the way. Trust me, the best play is to look and see what the rest of the empire is doing and do that. He said more than he knew when he said his kingdom is not of this world, but to survive in this world, you must conform to this world, not some fantasy world. You and I and this Jesus, we die and that's the end. It's not for human beings to live forever. Only the Roman Empire is eternal. And don't talk to me about truth. What is truth? Reality is more important than truth. Expedient is more important than excellent. Being practical is more important than being right. That's the way it is. That's the Roman way. And unfortunately for some, the Jesus way is not the Roman way perspective. And so you and I then delivered him up to be crucified. And you and I took Jesus to the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. And there you and I had him crucified with two other men. And Pontius Pilate wrote a generous inscription and put it on the cross. And the inscription read, someone else's king, Jesus of Nazareth, one chapter in my biography. And you and I signed that document gladly, someone else's king. Keep things in perspective. Deal with this world as it is, not how you wish it to be. Don't let such little things interfere with your life. Let's pray. Pray with me. Most merciful Father God, we, like Pilate, often have a warped sense of perspective. We, like Pilate, section Jesus off from the rest of our lives. We, like Pilate, sometimes treat the machine as valuable and people as cheap, interchangeable cogs. We, like Simon Peter, hear the cock crowing. And we, like the blind man, need you to spit in our eyes so that we might see again. But you, O oh Lord, pour out your love abundantly, so patient with us, so careful of us, your beloved sheep. Help us to serve you, Lord, or, or before even that, help us to desire to serve you how we long to do what is really right, how we long to want to want what is right. Help us to desire to serve you. Give us the determination and courage to take those steps toward you, the steps that were too hard for Pilate. Give us the courage not to conform to the systems and institutions and values of our world when we know there are better ways when we know there are things we could do, things we know we should do. Lord, we can see the ideal steps. Help us to take them, to, to try. And like a loving parent with the first steps of his toddler, you'll reach out to help as soon as you see what we're trying to do. 
Help us to reach out to each other and to you. Turn our institutional and individual lives around, we pray. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, our king, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without beginning or end. Amen.